I don't have a science background. And that absolutely um, killed me at times in the police department. I wish I would have, especially, namely, when I went to the DEA um, clan lab school, clandestine laboratory school, where we learn about meth labs or methamphetamine laboratories. And the first three days is chemistry. Um, I was very glad to know that at that time I had been in this classroom under Mr. Bingham's instruction here for a chemistry class, to which I got an A, and then I got a B in the lab, though, so I had it kind of backwards, but uh, I still remember that. And, um, and he wouldn't, even I went back and argued with him and tried to get that A in that class, and he wouldn't give it to me, but that's okay, that's okay. I know what you drive, but that's okay. All right, but uh, it was very, very difficult. That class, in the, very, the first three days, is nothing but chemistry. Absolute nothing but chemistry, and uh, I struggled through it, um, made it through that to learn all about and cooked meth and everything, but I didn't have a science background, and through my career, uh, you know, next month will be 14 years at Paducah Police Department, six years of the Marine Corps, I've got 20 years experience. It's been difficult without uh, having the limited amount of science that I have. I don't know how you could make it. A lot of the slides that I have here are, um, and a lot of the information that I've gathered, I've gathered from uh, Gary. Uh, he has, um, it was a great experience to have him uh, as a mentor at the police department, not only a supervisor, but a mentor. A lot of the information I have doesn't come from the book. And uh, you learn that from uh, having a, an experienced detective pass that down to you. And you learn from that experience and then well, I would pass the information that I had down to other detectives if they came in uh, to that unit. Today, the Paducah Police Department, their detective division, their investigative unit, I would put up against any investigative unit in, uh, in the United States. Absolutely, I mean, you, you may think I'm just blowing sunshine here, but absolutely, I mean, these are hardworking, uh, very, very intelligent guys. Uh, in 1970, you had to be six foot tall to be a police officer, and that's the only requirement. Uh, today, you have to have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And so you see how we've got an education has actually, you know, uh, is, is more important than where we're at. Science and policing um, is nothing new. Everybody thinks it's something new because you see all the advances in uh, um, DNA and all the advances you see people being let out. And it's just really, really big, but it's actually nothing new. Uh, in the 1887, um, the very first story came out about a police officer or a detective um, that, had, that used science to solve crimes. Anybody know who that is? Who? Say it again. Sherlock Holmes, exactly, Sherlock Holmes. That was 1887, and since that point, every, and Sherlock Holmes, he used, what did he use? He used his, uh, the deduction, analysis, came up with a theory, and proved his theory through the facts. And you tell me that's not science, and that's exactly what he used. Ever since that point, I hope I get that right, Sherlock Holmes, people have been fascinated with uh, policing uh, and detective work and the science in that. And, and I don't know why people are so fascinated, but in 2007, there was a, um, the, the top three hottest um, characters to play on TV was a doctor, a lawyer, and a detective. The shows that come out there, who here could go home right now, flip on your TV, and find, it, uh, find and scroll through all the 500 channels we have now, and not find a cop show? I mean, they're on there. You can name them. Over the years. After Sherlock Holmes, we had the detective magazines that some of you guys can remember. A bunch of you all can't. 77 Sunset Strip. One of my favorites right there. I loved his haircut. Uh, that's got to be my favorite right there. I'm not going to say why. I always loved that show, Hill Street Blues. And the music they played afterwards. I mean, that was really, or during... Right there we go. The man right there. Getting more modern day. Law and Order. I do watch Law and Order. All those cop shows, Law and Order is probably about the only one that I'll actually watch. CSI. CSI Miami, Law and Order, Law and Order, SVU, ABC, SUV. All the other Law and Orders that we have out there. Okay. There's a lot of myths when it comes to policing or it comes to what you see on TV. It's not always true. And we're gonna talk about a few of those myths and how science ties everything together. 
CSI, as you've seen at CSI Miami and everything, you watch that and they solve every single thing off, off of uh, the sites. Everything they do is some kind of, uh, I mean, you watch, and look at their labs that they have. I mean, they have billion dollar labs and they have 40 guys working on one case and it's great. And they drive this right here and you look at that. Uh, that's a crime scene vehicle right there. That's, that's an $80,000 vehicle. That's the myth. This is the reality, okay? <laughs> That's the Paducah Police Department Crime Scene Investigation Unit. As you see here, we got the rust on the front bumper. That's free. You got the air tank out to the side, a little gas tank in case we can't get it started. And what you don't see on the other side is the jumper cables right there because to get it started and everything. But it isn't pretty, but guys, it doesn't have to be pretty. Because the reality of it is, as a detective, as an investigator, and, and especially when you're dealing with the science and everything out there, we don't get in a hurry because what we deal with it's very, very small, very minute, very, very small pieces of evidence. If you get in a hurry, you're going to miss something. And as cold and calloused as this sounds, police officers, as detectives and everything, we've all said when somebody wants you to get in a hurry and you're working a homicide, they're not going to get any debtor. And so there's no reason to get in a hurry. Because if you get in a hurry, any amount of pressure you've ever felt in your life, whether it be before a test or whatever you've felt in your life, is nothing compared to sitting through a homicide trial. Until then, you, know, you have no idea what pressure is. Because what took you a few days, if you, had, if you solved the crime, and you worked on it for a week or two weeks, two years later, it goes to trial. Every bit of evidence you collected, every single thing you did, there's multiple lawyers, that has taken it, and if you left any holes, their job is to fill in the holes. Your job is not to leave anything undone. And, and, and that's, that's the whole kit and caboodle of being a detective, and that's, that's the pressures behind it. Here's another myth. I've been a detective, I've been a detective for uh, about eight years now, and I've never worked with anybody that looked like this or that went to a scene. <laughs> And uh, no offense to the guys and the girls that I've worked with, but uh, if you look at what she's wearing, I mean, come on. That's the whole myth. Nobody wears leather pants to a crime scene, okay? <laughs> and yeah, I don't know what she's looking for there, but, you know, here's the, rea the reality, the fact of it. That's what you look like, look like when you're out there working a crime scene. And, um, and I had somebody say this once, and, and, I, and I wrote it down, and I've kept it ever since. It's more about wearing coveralls and ca crawling around on a urine-soaked floor, sifting through dog crap looking for a shell casing, than wearing leather pants, $500 sun uh, sunglasses, working in a $5 million mansion looking for a hair fiber. And that's absolutely the truth. And uh, you see on TV, you see them out there. And let me tell you guys, I've, I've, I've wore those suits. And, you know, and the reason I wore those suits is because I've been on a urine-soaked floor, you know, sifting through dog crap looking for a shell casing. And that's more what it's about. Not everybody that you see or that you're going to get it to work just uh, had just passed away. But the evidence and everything that we talk about, all the evidence in the world that we gather and all the science in the world isn't worth a flip unless we gain it and we obtain it in a manner that it will be acceptable to the court and it satisfies court admissibility rules. And and like I said, some of this, this is uh, what I've learned for, from uh, Gary here, a lot of things that he's brought. One of the things they have to do is identify each item of evidence and collect and handle. You have to take every single piece that you've collected, every swab of blood. Now, you ever see the O.J. Simpson case, and they were swabbing, a little Q-tip swab of that blood. Now, you have to identify where that blood came from. Later on with the slides, I'll show you exactly uh, where that comes into play and how important that is in one swab can make or break your, your case. The location, the condition of the evidence is the time it was collected. If you, get, if you obtain a bloody shirt, you can't just take that and put it in a plastic bag and stick it in, a, uh, in an evidence locker because blood and plastic, once you seal it, is going to rot. And so then you just lost your evidence. It has to dry. But you still have to say that the reason you put it in a drying room is because it was soaked with blood and it had to dry. Who, uh, when it uh, had contact with it, the evidence, every time it's touched, it's handled by whoever it's handled by, there's a sheet and you fill it out, it's a chain of custody. And you have to do that. Because anytime you touch anything, anytime you go anywhere, you leave something. 
That's the whole thing behind the science of policing. You came in this room today. We could prove that you're in this room today if you got up right now and left. And I'm not talking about your fingerprints. I'm talking about the hair that came out of your head, not my head. <coughs> but the hair that has fallen out of your head. I'm talking about uh, your sweaty palms or whatever that you've left here, the drink you leave behind with your DNA on it. I'm talking about your dead skin cells falling off into your, where you just finished scratching or scratching your head or picking your nose or the booger you left under the table <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, you gotta explain why the evidence was handled. Why did you take the evidence to the drying room? Because it was soaked with blood. Um, any changes that were made to the evidence? Uh, we sent it to a lab. That we sent it to the, uh, the crime scene lab. So we have actual scientists who are gonna go through it and they're gonna look at it and tell us if this bullet matches this gun. Well, they're gonna have to do a series of tests so they may alter that. And so since it was altered, they have to explain why they altered your evidence. Um, Impressions. We get impressions. Some of the things that we use in science, this is how science comes into policing. Uh, you see this footprint here, wonderful footprint. All right? We take this and we would take it and we would photograph it. And we would photograph and use probably a roll of film on something like this. Or if they're digital, we would do all that. If you see on there, you'll see where it's got the ruler beside of it. And we take that and we measure and you have all kinds of pictures from different angles straight above it and we'd have it measured out and then we would try to lift that print. The way we'd lift that print is we would use dental stone and we would put poor dental stone there and try to lift it up. Now why are we taking so many pictures if we're going to take and put dental stone on there and lift this print? Why would you think? If we're going to have the print, because once you put the dental stone in it, you flip it over, boom, you've got the footprint with you to keep. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen when Murphy's Law steps in there, you go in there and something happens wrong, you didn't mix it correctly or something you've done wrong and you're gonna lift the print and you break it in half about the time you flip it over. Or what if you have a wreck on the way back to the office and this evidence is right there beside you in your vehicle and you're taking it back. You're in that nice crime scene van and somebody doesn't see you and runs over you and tears you up. Or the crime scene van catches on fire. Um, there's a lot of things about that. One of the things that everybody knows about because you cannot, if you've, you had to live in a cave for the past 20 years not to know uh, a little bit about DNA, because it's been in so many major crime scenes. I mean, it's, uh, if, if you were, if you even had a TV on during the O.J. Simpson trial and all that, you know all about DNA. Um, the truth about DNA, you watch Law and Order, you watch CSI, and I saw a Law and Order show not too long ago, Ro Lenny was up there and he takes some blood, or they had some crime scene techs and they were over there and they swabbed for blood. He says, take that to the lab and put a rush on it. Well, if I said something like that, everybody would just kind of laugh. Because you know what, our, uh, DNA, the truth and the reality of it is that it could be up to a year before I get the DNA back. It could be more than that. We had a case to where Billy Hodges, a patrolman, was investigating a burglary. Uh, he goes in there, a guy crawled through a window, and a guy cut himself coming through the window where he busted it out. Billy took the swab, the blood swab, packaged it correctly, sent it off to the lab. Well, they entered it into the system, and we'll talk about what system they entered it in here in a second. They entered it into the system, and there's no hit. So it stays in the system, and it's run, and every time you put another one, another sample in, it runs all of them continuously like that to see if they have a match. I think it was four years after Billy worked that burglary, it came back and a guy had went to a prison in Illinois. And if you go, if you're convicted of a felony in Illinois, they take your blood and they enter you into the national database. And that's how we build a national database. And we got a hit on it. And we brought him back and he didn't confess to it, but he pled guilty to it anyway. And I mean, it would be, it's kind of hard because we went and found out where he was living at that time. And uh, he lived, I think it was like 137 feet from that business. And his DNA happens to be on the broken window. And his only statement was, I wasn't even living in Paducah at that time. So that was just as good to us as a confession. You know, him saying he didn't even live in Paducah at the time, but yet his blood showed up on the uh, glass fragments where he broke it. Um, the truth of the matter is, and I told you as a joke, you know, put a rush on it. And, and you see that um, 
The world's largest CSI facility is the LA County Coroner's Office. And you would think there's gonna be hundreds of people working there. And the reality of it is there's 24 people. Only 24 people work there. They have 24, seven, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week service, 364 days a year. And they have a total of 40 specialties. Um, at the Paducah Police Department, we don't have our own crime scene um, laboratory. We use one out of Madisonville that has its own specialty. And you have Louisville and you have Frankfurt. And each have their own specialties. And that's the ones that we use. Uh, interesting fact is that the first case in this area that ever used DNA that solved the, clack, uh, solved the case uh, was in the 80s, and that was by uh, Detective Sandy Joslin. Uh, Detective Sandy Joslin, since retired from Paducah Police Department, came back, she's the interim chief, and my main man Ian here, that's his mother. And he's in his class today, and his mom was the very first one to come up there and collect evidence and submit it and have it in the DNA. The DNA in the, in the 80s was a lot different than what it, was, what it is today and the samples you had to get. You had to get like a quart of blood to get a DNA sample, and now we get like a skin cell and you can get a DNA sample. So you see in just a, a small amount of time uh, how advanced and how science is advancing and, and policing. Um, we talked about the uh, different, uh, or I told you about the different uh, database. In May 2008, Senate panel approved uh, the expansion of Kentucky's DNA database. And all that gets entered into uh, the CODIS, is what it's called. CODIS is the Combined DNA Index System. Um, and that's where all the DNA goes. It's still small, really small compared to the fingerprint. APHIS, or the Integrated Automatic Fingerprint Identification System, has 47 million prints. And so when you send a print off, it runs through 47 million people to see if they get a match. There's 47, 47 million samples. Uh, in CODIS, there's 4.3 million is all there is. So it's, uh, it still has some catching up to do. But you can see it's one of those things in how we're going about it. By every convicted felon, it's going to get there. And it will be there one day. Um, DNA is expensive. I uh, see it's those unreal expectations that these CSI shows have really, really thrown on us. Is that we, as uh, police officers, we have people who, who have those unreal expectations. If I come to your, uh, if you get your tire slashed by a uh, crazy boyfriend or crazy girlfriend, and as they were slashing your tires, they busted their knuckles across a pavement and they have a little bit of blood there, the first thing you're going to say is, can you swab that, get the DNA, and then, you know, we'll go over and take him to jail. Can you do that? Absolutely I can do it. Do you have the $10,000 it's going to cost to send that off? Because are we going to spend as a Paducah Police Department are we going to spend state funds, taxpayers' money, $10,000 for your $150 tire? Because that's what it will come down to. You know, so it's expensive. And it's one of those unreal expectations because on CSI, they can do that. Uh, DNA only proves that the person was there. Their DNA was left there. It only proves that it's that person's DNA. It isn't the you know, bright shining light that comes on and the angels start to sing as soon as the DNA comes back and that solved your case. And that's all you need. It's not that way. There's so much more that goes into it and it, it's the unreal expectation. Uh, DNA, I've told you, DNA results, they're by far, they're not very quick at all. And they're not easy to understand. If you think that uh, DNA results are easy to understand, you know, I get a one-liner back that says one and 47 trillion people are a match to this person's DNA. That's all I need right there. I don't want to know much more. Because if it has to be much more, I want the person who ran this and the person who has the background in this to come explain it to a jury. Uh, when you try to get too technical also, you go over a jury's head. And the jury just completely loses it and they dismiss it all. O.J. Simpson case. I hate that statement. I can get a print off the air. That guy on CSI. I hate that. I hate that guy for saying that. Because you know how many people come up to us now and your car got broke into and we're supposed to go get a fingerprint off of that? And because it's jerks like that that say stuff like that? And so they expect us to do it as police officers. And I mean, everybody expects that. But not every scene has usable prints. And everybody thinks that. A usable print, sure, it'd be great if I had 
a surface uh, just like this glass, uh, this screen right here, and somebody walked over to it and pushed it exactly straight up and straight down with their finger and left that print. That would be wonderful. I would enjoy that. That'd be so good to go dust for print. But obtaining a print depends on the moisture or lack of moisture. You get the real sweaty hands, you're going to smear a lot um, on somebody's hands. The texture of the surface, your dash of your car. People expect us to get fingerprints off that. Does anybody have one that's like smooth like glass or does it all have like a couple of those kind of ridges and when you put the armor on it kind of shines and looks really, really good? Everybody has those. Well, they're difficult to get off that. Is it possible? Absolutely possible. Uh, the frequency has been touched. Who here has a doorknob that you finished, finished spraying with 409 and you went and wiped it off and you cleaned it off? When's the last time you did your doorknob that way with whatever or antibacterial wipe and you got it completely cleaned and you polished it with Brasso and nobody's touched it? So if somebody comes through your door, you're like, can you get their fingerprint off that door? Yeah, can you get me a list of the number of people that's touched your door here lately in the last five years? <laughs> you know, run that by me and we'll get her all knocked out. And I mean, yeah, will we dust that? Absolutely. Is there a possibility? Absolutely. And we'll still go through those things. And I'm not saying we'll blow it off because of that. Um, cars. I can get that print off your dashboard. All I have to do is fume for it. And what I mean by fuming is take some super glue and you take a little super glue and you put it down on, you know, on, a, on a paper plate and you take your finger and stick it in there real quick and then go wash your finger off and you'll look and you'll have a really, really nice print in that super glue. Fuming is very, very similar to that. And we can fume the inside of your car, heat up what we put in there and it would smoke and all the smoke would come off and anywhere there's a fingerprint, it would be just like that fingerprint I just told you to do with the super glue. Okay? Then I want you to take whatever cleaner you want to and clean that super glue up off of there after it's set for a day off that paper plate. Or do you think it's probably pretty much ruined? I could get that fingerprint off your car, but I'm going to ruin the interior of your car if I do it. Because everywhere there's a fingerprint, it's going to show up and it's going to be hard and stuck that way. How many places in your car have you touched? So everybody wants us to get that fingerprint. The uh, steering wheel, can you get a fingerprint off the steering wheel? It's uncommon because think of the texture that's on there. It's uncommon, it's not impossible, but it's uncommon. Um, like I said, it's, it's expensive, very time consuming, and um, it's, it's very difficult. Crime scene lab, uh, when we take uh, the fingerprints, we get them and then we're sending, we get your fingerprints and we dust and use the magic wand and come up there, boom, and we've got a fingerprint, usable prints. We take that print, we send it off to a lab, it run through a computer, and they come up and they say, we've got a match. It's not as simple, they print out a match and they have a little printout and they send it to you. Uh, and you see that on TV, you'll see them and they'll be flashing on the screen, just thousands of them, and you have one guy sitting right in front of that one. And all of a sudden, as soon as the detective comes over to see how things are going, boop, we've got a match. And they take off and they go. Well, it's not that way. They take it and then they will verify the match by hand, because they just don't trust the computer. I mean, computers are great, but it's no match for the, for the human mind. Um, backlog. If I send a homicide, if I send a rape case, and I have a serial rapist, and I have fingerprints, that's going to come back to me pretty quick. That's going to be within inside 30 days, because I would be telling them, I have, a, I have a serial rapist that I have to get off the street. I need to know this match. Whereas if somebody broke into your car and stole your and they left the print on the outside of the door, I sent some prints from the outside of the door, and they stole your CD player. That could be a year or more. Um, prints aren't always obtained by dusting. And you see that, I've talked about the big feather duster, that you see them go over there and they sit there and they throw a little bit of dust up there and boom, magically the print appears. And it's not always that way. There's things called like ninhydrin, and you see a letter Somebody has a letter and uh, somebody, your, your crazy ex-boyfriend, crazy ex-girlfriend is sending you all these crazy letters and, and when they send them to you, uh, on paper we use something called ninhydrin, which is a chemical that I would spray on your paper and then these fingerprints and everybody's touched it, it's going to show up and I can get your fingerprints off that. And that's a really easy process, it's just like all you have to do is just take it and spray it and uh, there's a few other things to do, but you have to have a well-ventilated area because that stuff is, is, is a bad mamma jamma. It's bad stuff. Uh, but you have the ninhydrin, 
And uh, if you don't know what a mamma jamma is, then you're too young. All right, I told you about fuming, uh, ninhydrin, magnetic powder. You see, the dust is actually a volcanic rock. You can get the volcanic rock that's ground up, and it's a dust, a very, very fine dust that gets in the air. Uh, I could guarantee that if I wore a white shirt that I was going to have to get out and dust that day. And it was always good for me just to stick my hands in there and just wipe it all over me because if I tried to keep it off of me, I'd have it all over me by the end of the day anyway. That's really, really messy stuff. We used magnetic a lot. And medic, magnetic works great on things like a styrofoam cup. Um, I, did a, a, I did this for a class, and we took a, um, just a sleeve of styrofoam cups, pulled one out of the middle, and we're seeing if there was any prints on it. And I was wearing gloves. And in the center of the cup, of the center of the sleeve, there was a thumbprint. Or there was a print. Not was a thumbprint, but there was a print in a brand new sleeve that we had just opened up. And it makes you wonder, why is there a print in the middle of this? And who touched this? And I was going to drink coffee out of that cup. So next time you go to drink coffee out of a styrofoam cup, think about that. So uh, there's, a thing, there's another chemical that we used is amido black. Amido black is a chemical that adheres to the protein in blood. If I have a crime scene to where I have a wall that has a huge smear across it, and that smear looks like somebody's hand went there, I could use a chemical called amido black that would clean a lot of that up, and it would adhere to the protein in the blood. Hence this picture. This is an actual crime scene that came from the Paducah Police Department, case that I worked. I got these prints. That's the actual sheetrock, because I was so tickled that it magically appeared like it was supposed to that I took a sawzall and cut it out of the wall, and it's still in evidence today. That right there is if you see there's four fingers, four fingers, because it was a smear of blood over the top of the victim's head. After we removed the victim, which took several, several hours, probably I'd say eight hours after we started working the crime scene, we removed the victim uh, because we didn't want to move her until we had everything else done because we weren't in a hurry. Um, well, I saw this smear, and some of the guys from uh, the Frankfurt uh, were there from APHIS. And uh, I asked them, I said, and we were talking about Amido Black because of all the blood. It was a very bloody crime scene, and probably one of the bloodiest crime scenes that I've ever worked. And I said, what about Amido Black? I heard about that when I went to one of these investigator schools. Do you think it would work? One investigator said, I've used it. I've used it a lot in Florida. I never got a hit off of it. It never did anything. The other guy said, hey, I've used it a couple times, and I haven't had, you know, about half the time it comes out. And he goes, but it looks like a pretty good smear. So I went over there, and what's the first thing I did? I took a swab of the blood, because whose blood is it? Is it the suspect's blood, or is it the victim's blood? I don't know. So I took a swab of the blood. Came back later that I found out it's the victim's blood. This pops up, and I took, I don't know, two or three rolls of film of it, because I was so tickled that they came out that good and I didn't want to lose that evidence. And I actually cut it, the whole of the wall and took those with me because I didn't want to lose the evidence. And uh, that picture was actually taken only about three months ago. And that homicide was uh, worked probably, um, I would say 2004, 2003. And uh, we had four homicides in three weeks. And this is one of the homicides. Uh, this was actually the second homicide we'd had in 24 hours. And so you had a lot of very tired detectives. Uh, working on this case, but um, we, uh, I just took that picture and it's still, it's still there. But now I have his palm print his fi and four of his fingerprints and it comes back her blood. He pled, and we had other evidence, a lot of other uh, scientific evidence. We had fingerprints all over the place, blood evidence everywhere. Um, with all that evidence and because of the use of science like this and chemicals like Amido Black, he pled guilty took a plea of life without the possibility of parole. He pled saying, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail and never get out because of evidence like this. He didn't have a chance. And the only thing he wanted to do is avoid the death penalty. More evidence. Paint. Oh, paint is so overlooked. Now, people don't think paint. Paint is one of those uh, things that our, um, our accident reconstructionists use a lot. They use a whole lot because there's paint transfer. You run somebody down, the paint, the glass, and everything off of your car is going to be on them. And parts of them are going to be where? In your car. 
And so if you run over somebody and think you're going to leave and then not and get away with it, chances are you're not. Because when you go to get your car fixed, even if they put brand new parts on it, they can say that these parts came off your car because we checked those places. So if you run somebody over, just stick around. It'd be better on you in the long run. Uh, and there's how we match paint. Paint chips are matched that way. Glass. Oh, you see here the glass, the sequence of penetration. Glass is great. We can take glass, and if you run over somebody, like I said, and we can take the glass that came out of their body or and, uh, match it with the glass that comes from your car where you broke your headlight. We can match that type of glass. Uh, fractures. You can tell that the very first one, the one here that would be on your left, is the very first shot bullet hole that came through that window. How can I tell that? Because the second shot, the fractures will not cross the first one once they already came. They won't cross. And you see when they come up to it, they stop. And so we can tell the sequence of events that came through and we can start developing um, our own theory of what happened in the crime scene by looking that way. The examination of the bullet hole and the way the, bullet, the, way the glass is actually shaped and bent uh, and it bends the glass, we can tell the uh, direction of the bullet. Is this an incoming bullet or is it an outgoing bullet? We have a couple guys get into a firefight and they're shooting through a big glass window that doesn't shatter and you've got bullet holes back and forth uh, through a windshield even. We know who was shooting which direction and who, which one of these bullet holes are going which way. Um, close examination can, can tell us the amount of force that was used to break the glass and uh, by the distance the glass is from where it originally was and, 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 and so forth. Taking a bite out of crime. More science involved here. Bite mark evidence. Uh, bite mark evidence. What's the very first thing you're going to do besides start photographing? Remember I told you about that photographing? Say it again. Swab for DNA. Absolutely. Swab for DNA. I turned on and, uh, what's her name? Nancy Grace or, yeah, in the crime scene shows. Man, she was flat tearing these detectives up one day. And she was on the police's, I mean, case like you wouldn't believe. Because they had a case and they didn't swab. And they didn't swab for DNA. The police showed up and asked the guy for his dental impressions. And he said no. Where did he go right after that? To the dentist. And he went to the dentist. And they tracked it down that he would went to, to Mexico. <laughs> Why you'd go to... A dentist in Mexico, I have no idea. But he went to, uh, uh, you know, a, a dentist in Mexico so he wouldn't get caught. And boom, they have no evidence. A big, nice bite mark, bite mark like this. Um, but that whole thing, the whole thing about it is you swab it to use it for DNA. You take it, you take the photographs. Uh, scientists will study this and they'll look at it under the microscope and your, your uh, forensic dental people will come up with a, an actual cast of what somebody's teeth would look like on this and then they can match it to the exact impression. They take that and they, or they can take um, your where you've been to the dentist and they take your bite mark and they can match it exactly to where you bit somebody. And that's why it's so important. It's so important for us as as police officers not to tip somebody off and not to forget to do things like that um, and the science that's involved with that and, and to use it to your advantage. Uh, we would uh, as a I'm telling you right now, we would never ever go to ask somebody for consent to get a dental impression. If I have it and I have enough evidence, I'm going to wait till I get the evidence uh, and I can get a search warrant because then I'm protected by the law, I'm protected by the judge, and I'm going to go to this guy when he has no idea that I'm coming and put the habeas snatches on him and take him to and get a uh, dental impressions done and do it that way and where he never knows it's coming so he doesn't change or alter his teeth. Oh, who's this? Anybody know who that is? Bigfoot. That's Bigfoot. Bigfoot make the news here lately? Absolutely. What did they find out about Bigfoot? He's a fake. What's one of the ways they determined he was a fake? Hair sample. Bigfoot's hair was polyester. <laughs> Didn't help. 
I know that they put, and I think they found four different animal uh, intestines inside of him. I think possum and different things like that, that he was full of. And uh, it was a suit. All right, it was a suit. Uh, hair fibers. I mean, you see that on TV, the hair fibers and everything. Uh, they're very, very important. Uh, one of the things hair can show us, we walk to a scene and I walk into a hotel room and there's chunks of hair laying everywhere. That tells me what? Somebody is not showering or... What does it tell me? Somebody's not shampooing their hair? It tells me there was a fight. This was a violent scene right here. Because, I mean, it takes something just to pull somebody's hair out. I mean, you've got to actually, you know, like I said, put the habeas snatches on it to get that hair out of their head. Um, hair. What hair can tell us? It can tear, tell us if it's human, if it's animal. Tell us the species. Tell us if your hair is dyed, if it's bleached. Uh, the difference in shampoo residues. The presence of contaminants. Uh, such as gunshot revenue, the uh, presence of semen, the presence of blood. It can tell us any kind of uh, different abnormalities or diseases or deficiencies. It can tell us if it's uh, the, eth uh, the ethnicity, the, I hate saying that word. It can tell us from your race. How's that? The body area from the, which, uh, from the body area, it tell us if the hair came from your legs or if it came off your back. Ooh. It can tell us uh, if the hair was forcibly removed. It can tell us if there's drug use and how long ago that drug use was. Yeah. You look a lot of concerned faces. Uh, just joking. <laughs> tell us if there's smokers or non-smokers. And, um, and we can take it and compare it to a known hair. Uh, we find a hair in the trunk of a car. And then we find a, you know, we're looking for a child. And we find that child's hair, or we find a hair in the trunk of a car, the mother's car, and then later on we find the child and we compare it, we can say that hair that came out of the trunk was, came from the child. So we can compare it to a known hair. And so it gives us great evidence that way. Guns and bullets. If I came to this crime scene, I would probably rule out suicide. But that's just me. All right? If you look at one of those dowel rods, these rods that you see right there that's going into that, that this is actually a... Uh, uh, crime scene, uh, and this is our bullet holes going in and through the car. Um, you can see uh, things that you can take and just look at. Uh, you can see that this car was probably in motion. Uh, if the shooter or shooters, either the car was in motion or the shooter or shooters was in motion. But we know this wasn't just a stationary thing where they walked up and shot because you look at the dowel rods, if I can get this thing to work, right here. And you can see the angle this one's going. And you see some that are in this angle, that angle, and you see the different angles that they're going. So we can probably surmise that either the shooting started this way, and as they came by, it continued to shoot this way, and as they passed by, it was shooting this way, or vice versa in the car. So those things can tell us a whole bunch. Uh, the term ballistic, when you hear ballistic, uh, and that's the old Tom Cruise from uh, Top Gun, where he said we're going ballistic. The term ballistic is the science of traveled uh, the science of the travel of a uh, projectile in flight. The flight path of the bullet includes travel down the barrel, uh, includes traveling down the barrel, the path through the air, and the path through the target. Um, is, is, that's what all that is considered. When we talk about firearms evidence and we send in evidence to a lab a, a sci in the science of the firearms, and uh, that's one of the things that I teach and one of the things that I love to teach, I've taught since uh, 1999, is firearms. And I absolutely love the, the, the firearms. And firearms is more of a discipline. It's not so much you get out there and see how many rounds you shoot. It's more of a discipline. Uh, if you don't believe that, then uh, uh, a lot of stuff that we do, I can teach anybody in here to stand still and shoot a piece of paper and uh, how simple that is just to stand here and we'll shoot little bitty holes in that paper. But what we teach as police officers is actually gunfighting. And so it's, it's a lot different. You shoot, you move, you communicate. And uh, you've got to know a lot about weapons. Uh, Kevin Neal, uh, one of our, our snipers, it was a scout sniper instructor in the Marine Corps for uh, eight years. And, and that guy can bore you to death. And if you're ever tired or you ever can't sleep, you can have this call this guy, and he can tell you about ballistics coefficients until you are out just like that. And, I mean, this guy and, and, and what he does with, with all that is just unreal. It's way beyond me. And how he looks at a mirage and can tell you how, how the wind's blowing at 1,000 yards because of the mirage that you see out there is, you got it. I'm not taking a shot at 1,000 yards because I am not that good. All right, firearms that we submit, the evidence that we submit, we'd submit the firearm. Tell you if that firearm actually fired the bullet that we recovered. Spent casings. 
to where you see the spent shell casings that have went across the, uh, the street and everything. And I've got a picture I didn't include here to where I worked a uh, shooting that happened over on Guthrie Avenue. And uh, the backyard is nothing but yellow placards all over the place where they have the evidence. And uh, there was um, 33 rounds fired. Well, that's 33 of those placards for the shell casings that we found. We found a lot of places where the bullets hit, so we marked those where they hit. There were actually bullets just laying on the steps to where they had traveled through the house and everything, and they lost their energy, and they were laying on the steps. And so we're trying to reconstruct that, and we have one person who got shot. We actually had uh, five people shooting, 33 rounds. One person got hit, and they got hit twice, which is kind of typical of that. We send recovered bullets. The bullet that was recovered out of that guy's body on, on Guthrie Avenue, we sent that bullet in. Uh, we sent in clothing. We sent the wadding. Uh, the shot, that come, the wadding comes out of shelves. Uh, the shot, and um, we also can send off uh, any live ammunition to match to the weapon. Um, gunshot residue. That's the residue. When you fire a gun, you see a big flame coming out of the end of the gun, and you can touch it, and you see all the powder that comes out of it. What it's doing is if the primer's igniting that powder and it's burning it. And uh, that burn, is, is, that's where that fire comes from. Well, then you have gunshot residue. And it's a little kit that we do these swabs, and it will tell us if you have the residue uh, on your hands. Because if you looked at any firearm, you see that you have the little slide that goes up and down here, or a revolver has holes in it, that fire and all that's going to come out. You ever touch a barrel of a weapon that's been fired several times? It gets kind of warm. All that fire is getting, it's escaping, and that dust is coming out, getting on your hands. Other things gunshot um, residue can tell us, and some of these pictures here are kind of graphic, all right? So uh, I apologize if it, if it you know, bothers you. Uh, this is a stellate, this is a contact wound. If you look, the star shape right there, that's where somebody took a weapon and they stuck it directly to the forehead. Uh, if you look at a M16, any of you people that's been in the military, or an M4, at the very uh, tip of it has a flash suppressor. And you'll see where, the, where that's where the, you know, the fire can come out and it can take and it's less muzzle flip. It's a lot of different things. And it suppresses the uh, fire from getting out so you don't get seen. Um, that is very typical of a flash suppressor right there. They stuck it to a rifle to somebody's forehead and pulled the trigger. And you see how the fire came out and went different directions. That's a contact wound. Uh, now you've backed the weapon away less than 18 inches right here. And you see that powder is still coming together. And you think the powder, when it comes out, it comes out like a cone. And the further away it gets, the more it spreads out. And you can see where it's not too very far out right there. And you can see where the bullet actually makes the entry. And you can see the burning around it. It's almost like a heart shape on the side. And then you have tattooing, which is up to 25 inches away. And you can see where those pieces of, um, of gunpowder are actually going on there. And they're actually burning on the skin right there, making those little burn marks. And that's what gunshot residue can tell us. Um, a target to distance. This is all science. Um, another nice show. A nice, I hope you all just had lunch. I haven't had lunch. My stomach keeps growling. And I'm really afraid you can hear it on this microphone here. So I uh, hope, hope you don't hear that. Oh, you get these popular shows. They show the flies, and they get a fly, and you see them dig around for a maggot, and they pull this little maggot out, and uh, they determine the time of death. That's true. That, that really does happen. Uh, when I went to uh, um, basic investigator school, uh, we got to go to the body farm. Um, uh, Gary Reese, Gary was uh, at a class that he was going through, a leadership class that he was at too, and he got to go to the body farm at the same time, and that was uh, at the University of Tennessee. Pretty neat, they have bodies laid out everywhere. And they study the maggots and how that goes. Uh, how, and the, uh, how the bodies actually deteriorate over time, and they actually study that, and they're able to give us this kind of of, um, of evidence and all. But it's a fact, guys, when you die, you stink. And um, that stink is very appetizing to flies. And that's the truth. And you're pretty pre preoccupied at that time with being dead, so you fail to swat the flies. And so those flies start doing what? They start landing on you. All right, so once they land on you, what does a fly do about immediately when it starts to land? It's going to start laying eggs, throwing up and laying eggs. And so when it lays eggs, what happens after that? Those eggs hatch. And what are those eggs called? Maggots. And that's where you get the maggots. Now, if you take all this process has been studied, and it tells you exactly how long it will take, and we can work our way backwards according to the maturity 
of the fly or of the larva, any of the flies that we, fi we find in the scene, and we can tell you how long somebody's been there and how long this guy here with the beard and the teeth that it has been there. And um, we work our way backwards. This isn't new. This isn't anything that's really, really that new. This started in the 1880s when a guy doing some studies noticed that when somebody died, immediately a fly landed on them and they didn't swat it away. Well, because they're preoccupied with being dead. So they didn't get to swat it away. Remember I told you about the crime scenes? Maintaining a crime scene? Who are the people standing in the background of this person's crime scene? You have those kind of people, you have people standing in your crime scene, guess what happens to all your evidence? It's contaminated, it's gone, it's worthless. All the science in the world isn't going to help you. That's what it really looks like. That's a crime scene. How many people do you see in that crime scene? None. Tape everywhere. Um, we have a perimeter, an outer perimeter, an inner perimeter. And only certain people are allowed in and out, and they're logged in and out of the crime scene to maintain that chain of custody with that science and that evidence. All right, some of you guys really interested in being crime scene investigators and all, this is the truth of the matter, okay? You see it on TV and those crime scene investigator guys and they're so cool and those crime scene investigator girls are so cool. The truth is they don't carry guns. Crime scene investigators don't. They don't carry guns at all. And you see them there all the time. They get their guns out and everything. They don't really carry guns. They're not really police officers. They wear coveralls, they do the dirty work, and they drive beat up old vans and beat up old trucks. And that's what it really comes down to, and they don't drive Humvees. But let me tell you something. If you have a, have a desire to do that, it can be one of the most rewarding careers you'll ever have. Um, you can leave, and you can get a job, and you can go to work for eight hours, and you can come home, and you can do that 40 hours a week, and the only thing you expect is a paycheck, and you live your life. But going into something like that, and into policing or the science of policing, you're not entering a job, it's a passion. I'm not going to say it's a job, it's an adventure. I'm not going to do that one. But it is a passion. You have a passion for the job. And you have a passion to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Is it going to be glorious? No. Will you get your name in a paper? Probably not. Will your face ever get in a paper? No. On TV? Is anybody ever going to call you and say, thanks? Maybe once in a 25, 30 year career, twice. Will you ever, ever, hardly ever get to see any of your cases go to court? Here and there, and then you'll gripe because you gotta leave your home in Louisville and come down to McCracken County and stay for a three day trial to where you get up and you testify for 45 minutes and you go home, so it's a lot of hurry up and wait. It's thankless, it's faceless, and it is bigger than what you are. It's a passion. And it is, and you know, I, I take that back where I said at the beginning, to where people are fascinated with it because, and I don't know why they're fascinated with uh, um, the science and policing. And I think it's because everybody here has a sense of justice about them. And everybody here wants justice. They hate to see the, the, the little guy screwed over. All of us hate that. If you don't believe me, who here is fired up over gas prices all going up last night? Right? And every one of us feel like we got the shaft on that end and feel like victims. And it's not a good feeling to feel like a victim. And every one of us would like to see somebody stand up at this time, an attorney general, come down and put a crackdown on these people and gas prices go back down. Every one of us would love to see that because we feel like victims. And we want justice. If you don't believe that, how did you feel seven years ago today? Right after 9-11, you wanted justice. You just saw that show last night on TV. That's all they said. You saw those, the people, they had the cameras, just little camcorders, and they would show people, and they said, I think we ought to go to war today. I think we ought to go to war today, and we ought to kill every one of them that's done this to us, to our nation. Now take that camcorder out and go to the same, go to Times Square again and find how many people say the same thing. Oh, what a difference time makes. But if you want to be part of that, it's, it's a very rewarding you be part of the whole criminal justice scene, the whole grand scheme of things. Not You'll be a part of, of from the cop to the detective to the prosecutor to the defense attorney to the judge, the juries, the Supreme Court. We'll all see your work. 